Yes. Yes. I, I first want to thank you, um, all of you here who work for the well-being and the dignity of people like the people in this film. Um, many of you, this is what you do, and I really appreciate it. Um, as Teresa said, you were the very first group to see this film, and so I thought I might share a little of the backstory with you that other people might not know. The book, as you can see from the film, was inspired by a friendship, right? Rather than what a lot of academic books are, like a research question. And even though I spent time with dozens of people experiencing homelessness, and Jason and I formally interviewed more than 70 people over seven years, the book and its approach is more intimate and personal. It's more about how people experiencing homelessness think about and negotiate their lives than it is about statistics or even policy. And in the telling, I am more really just a learner than an expert, exposing my own ignorance and transformation of mind as my perceptions were challenged by the people and the stories I encountered. So when the visionary director of NARBA, Mary Jo Gregory, approached me, and that was through the help of Kerry um, and, my, and, and a book group that happened to read this book, um, uh, initiated by Patrice Horseman, when, she, when Mary Jo approached me and said that she would like these stories to be part of the public conversation about homelessness through a film, whoa, right? How do I do this? What do I include? From all the topics that we broached in the book, from why people become homeless, to how they negotiate living unsheltered, from getting aid to panhandling, from pawn shops to day labor, the one we chose for the film was stigma. What it feels like to be a human being at the other end of our thoughts about homeless. Right? And we chose that topic because on a national basis, the public thinks it's absolutely fine for affordable housing or shelters and addiction treatment facilities to be built. These are great ideas but just not right here, right? Not in my backyard. And across the country, it is these NIMBY public attitudes rather than a lack of innovation or even a lack of money that limit the ways we can address homelessness. So it was attitudes, our own attitudes, that we made the centerpiece of the film. And then, of course, there's the choice to animate it. That maybe sounds weird. We chose animation because, well, consider the alternatives. If what's special about these stories is their intimacy and their authenticity, then how then do you hire professional actors to play the parts of real people who have shared their lives with me? Do you ask the people themselves, many who have moved on, to reenact past scenes in their lives, often painful ones, as you see, right? Can you see the problem? So animation was really our solution, with the additional caveat that the voices were spoken by people who were experiencing homelessness at the time. And I'd like to introduce you to some of those people here involved in creating the film. So, Stanley Pete. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he, he was the voice behind Jamie, the young Dine man who walked through the neighborhood to hostile looks, right? He was wonderful. And I'm so happy you could be here today. 
and what a contribution he's made to the conversation we need to have, not only about homelessness, but about its intersection with racism. Right? And someone you might recognize by sight, um, because he turned from a character into himself, <laughs> Billy Spies. He, he voiced the, the words of Randy as he panhandled handled with bladder cancer. Um, I'm still in touch with Randy, the real Randy. He, could, he, he lives in a different state now. And Billy is amazing. You know, you did a wonderful job. He works full time now. Um, and, and, and is a driver for the food bank. And Stanley, too, is working and, and, and on his own in, in housing. And I have to tell you that even though voice actors were paid to read lines, the reason folks did it was to make a contribution to our understanding. And many participants, including the guys you just met, refused payment. from Melissa, who, who voiced Penelope, who was um, evicted and lived in the shelter, and you saw her in the coffee shop, right? She now is also independently living and in Williams, and she couldn't make it here, but she wanted me to read you this. Greetings to you all. I'm sorry I couldn't be there today, but I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to be part of a most memorable experience in my life. I really love this totally awesome experience. She's young. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun and exciting, and I hope it gives an insight into homelessness. <laughs> and then I want to give a special shout out to Flagstaff Shelter Services staff and administration who, by the way, do provide day services for all they did to make this possible. I don't think anybody is here right now from, do I have anybody? Okay. Um, and if Darren Rudy is here, um, he's one of our sound engineers. But what he could tell you is that we managed to get professional quality sound and an active, noisy shelter because staff and residents, you wouldn't believe this, I wish I had pictures, took their mattresses and bedding and literally built a sound studio. <laughs> the voice actors. So thank you, Darren, Flagstaff Shelter Services. Um, this 15-minute film really took a village. Uh, the village of Flagstaff, along with Narba, Kerry Bloom, our absolutely wonderful producer. Kerry, we are okay. <laughs> our New York film director, Daniel Cowan, and would you believe it, a British animation team. Okay. Teresa Vera has been wonderful promoting the film, and she'll be getting the film out to the public, Teresa. And I hope she'll do that with your help, as you may see ways to use it in your own circles to influence and to spur conversation, you know, as you see fit. And you'll be able to move this film along after today um, for free. And before we leave today, um, allow me to share my greatest regret. Um, and that is that Ross can't be here with us today. Um, two weeks ago, and I want to be able to do this so that he can see some of this. Two weeks ago, 
Ross went into the VA hospital in Prescott for minor surgery on his neck. He sent me a picture in Priya after they had shaved off his beard. You know, he hadn't seen himself in 40 years that way. And I expected to talk with him that night. But there was a problem with his reaction to the anesthesia, and he's now at Barrows. And although he regained consciousness last Saturday, he's still in the hospital struggling and in restraints right now to regain his physical and mental functioning. Um, he has said to me more than once, I never thought in a million years I'd have all these people listening to what I have to say. And I will tell him he listens, and I'm so sorry he's missing his big event. But as I leave you for Teresa's final comments, I thought I might take out my phone and film all of you as you let him know how much you appreciated his voice in the film.